Okay, so maybe a bit of a background. Um, around my uh, person. Um, so I work as a, as a, as a freelance anti-fracking campaigner, basically. Um, for over six years, I've, I've started, you know, as a grassroots activist. Um, and during this long journey, I've, I've also um, had the pleasure to work with, with Scottish and, and English uh, anti-fracking activists. Um, that's how I uh, got to learn Callum and others. And while I was, I was, you know, supporting these groups in the UK and, and Scotland, I bumped into INEOS. Um, and, and all of a sudden, I've started to realize that um, this company um, wants to frack the UK, but it's not a, it's, it has nothing to do with, with um, the energy supply for your, your heating or the, or the power of your homes. Um, it is basically because this company wants to secure the raw materials they need and also the, the, the uh, methane to, to power their very energy intensive facilities to make more plastics. And this has opened up a, a complete new dimension for me. Um, and I've started to, to do some digging and that's how we started to um, actually um, initiate uh, a campaign uh, against Enios and, and also tried over the last um, three to four years to, to bring people together along the supply chain of Enios, which is coming from the US into, into Europe, um, in particular Scotland and Norway, and I'll also expanding to Antwerp in Belgium. You'll hear about this later on. Um, and referring or, or linking it to, to, the, to the headline for today's um, uh, chat, which is, um, you know, closing down big oil. A lot of people, when, when they talk about fossil fuels and, and the need to decarbonize our society, uh, they do often think uh, about energy and, and it's often about, the debate is often about homes. Um, but, but the real, you know, the, the sectors that are, that are the hard to abate sectors are, are key players. And, and one of the major sector is the petrochemical sector. And INEOS is a key player within the petrochemical sector. So they were, this is why it's important to pay attention to that because it also shows you that uh, a lot of energy is, is basically being wasted to create um, another uh, polluting uh, product, which is plastics, which ends up in the environment and so on and so forth. Um, and this first slide gives you um, the story in a nutshell. You, you see one of the dragon ships that Enios has commissioned. It's an extra class of ships that were built in China and that are now uh, transporting um, frack gas on a regular basis from the US to, uh, as already mentioned, Scotland, Norway, and Antwerp in order to uh, transform them into petrochemicals and also virgin plastic. And you also see a puffin in the picture um, with a lot of plastics in its stomach. And this has to do with the fact that uh, you guys have a big colony and the first of force, and I don't have to tell you. And scientists have found out that um, um, these, uh, that um, the birds, they, they eat the plastic pellets, uh, which are the first product of a, of a plastic company. And, and these pellets are being spilled um, in a structural way um, into the environment constantly. Um, and so the, the birds uh, pick them up because they think it's food and, and they die. Um, so that's kind of like the, the whole story. Um, and I could end here, but, but I have some more slides for you. So let's go through them. Um, starting from the, 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 the awareness that petrochemicals are about to rapidly become the largest driver of global oil. And this includes um, the so-called wet gas, which is ethane consumption. And this is ahead of trucks, aviation, and shipping. Today, the chemical sector is already the largest industrial consumer of fossil fuels and uh, accounts, and this is as of 2018, for 14% of global oil and 8% of gas primary demand. And the International Energy Agency expects that the, the cheap ethane consumption 
which has to do with the so-called shale gas revolution from the United States, will grow by 70% until 2030. And that's in part due to the expansion of US exports to regions uh, such as Europe. Now, the reality of that has, has been shaken in some ways um, because of the um, pandemic. But I personally expect that the prices, uh, prices will bounce back and we will be in a, in a, in a similar situation um, to, to the one that we had last year. And in actual fact, um, demand for polyethylene uh, remained quite stable during the pandemic. So this sector is, is, a, is a significant driver of oil and gas consumption. But with regard to its role um, within the global warming debate, it's completely under the radar. And we should talk about it nonetheless. And that's because um, according to, to, to numbers um, of the Center for International Environmental Law, by 2050, the full life cycle of plastic, and this includes fossil fuel extraction, transport, production, incineration, and the decaying waste in the environment, could generate 56 gigatons of CO2 emissions. Uh, and this is as much as 10 to 13% of our entire remaining carbon budget for a 1.5 global warming scenario. So again, this sector is important, is an important driver of global warming, and they are completely under the radar of the, of the um, climate movement and the debate um, that we're having around big oil and gas. And that's why, we need to, um, you know, to drag the curtain down and, and, and start pointing the finger to, to the key players within this sector, but also to the um, significant role that this sector plays. And unfortunately for you, in particular in Scotland, um, you'll have to, to deal with this company, Ineos, who unfortunately owns a lot of very crucial uh, infrastructure, uh, not only for Scotland, but for the whole of the UK. And there are no attempts whatsoever by Ineos um, to really go into, into the transition that we must do. Um, quite a contrary, um, the whole vision of this company is completely pass orientated and in actual fact, they buying off all the shit and shit that all the others uh, no longer want and they want to basically keep uh, us locked in to this fossil fuel dependency and in actual fact, they're, they're betting on us failing to, to be successful in our efforts to uh, mitigate and, and also tackle global warming. Now let's have a look at Ineos. What you see right there is, is the attempt to give an overview of, of the overall structure of the company. And you see it's quite complex, quite a complex monster. But at, at the core of the company, you have Ineos Limited. Uh, which is based on, on, on the Isle of Man, uh, which is a tax haven. And around it, you have companies based in, in Switzerland. Um, last year, they partly moved with, with their headquarters back to London. Um, they went into Switzerland in, in 2010, partly back. But this is roughly, nonetheless, the structure that, that is still there. Um, and what's very unique about this company compared to other major um, petrochemical companies and oil and gas companies is that the whole company is, is owned basically by one man. And his name is Jim Radcliffe, one of the richest men in the UK. Meanwhile, um, he owns roughly 62% of Ineos, meaning that, you know, whatever direction Ineos goes, this has to do with whatever Jim Radcliffe thing things that, that this company should go to. Now, I won't go into detail about all, all their mergers and, and how they became the company uh, they are nowadays, but I just want to briefly touch upon some, some major milestones. So Ineos was founded in 1998 when Jim Radcliffe bought a petrochemical camp, plant at Antwerp in, in Belgium and um, and Verb is, by the way, the second largest petrochemical cluster in the world after Houston. So it's, it's important. It's definitely the largest petrochemical cluster in, in Europe. So whatever kind of CO2 emissions are being generated at Antwerp, it will have a major impact on, on the overall um, EU um, greenhouse gas emissions. And, and by that, it will have an impact on our um, efforts to, to 
tackle um, global warming, but also to fulfill our obligations under the Paris Agreement. Only one year after they bought um, this plant at Antwerp, um, Jim Ratcliffe bought ICI, a major uh, chemical company in, in uh, Great Britain um, for quite some years. And the reason why, why um, Enios owns Grange Mouse and, and by that also at a later point uh, um, owns the Fortis pipeline system has to do with this takeover uh, um, from BP um, back in uh, 2005. Um, and, and this takeover uh, worth 5.1 billion pounds uh, required 4.9 billion pounds in bank loans. Um, and this gives you a, a rough idea of, of how this company grew and it grew by acquiring debt and more debt and by buying off new assets um, in order to also gain access to new loans to pay off the old debt. And this is basically more or less still um, this, the same structure that Enios is based upon. And this structure led in, in 2008, 2009, in the aftermath of the financial crisis, uh, led to, to some really severe shaking of, of, of this whole um, company. And Jim Radcliffe was, was um, really forced to think about maybe even closing down Grange Mouse. But what he did was, was not to close down assets. What, what he did was to um, embark on a new journey and, and to provide um, his um, investors basically with, with a new vision um, that, secured, um, that, that secured for him and the company new loans so that he was able to pay off his debt, but also provided this new perspective um, in order to get new credits. So that's again in, in 2009, uh, 2010, the debt towered at, at um, 6.7 billion pounds, and he had to pay almost 700 million in fees to banks. That's when he moved the, the headquarters to Switzerland in order to avoid more taxes. And then between 2010 and, and 2013, he managed to, to commission this dragon ships that I've mentioned. And he also convinced the Scottish and, and UK government to give him a loan um, worth 230 million in order to build the largest ethane storage tank at Grange Mouse. And, and this tank um, stores now frack gas from the US because the way out for Jim Radcliffe was to to uh, switch from, from NAFTA, which is crude oil, to ethane, which is frack gas. And this had to do with the fact that for a long time, the fracking industry in the US operating in a close market produced a glut of, of not only um, natural dry gas, which is methane, but also wet gas, which is ethane, propane, and butane. And the petrochemical industry can use these molecules as raw materials to produce virgin plastics. And this was exactly his escape plan, you know, switching from crude oil to frack gas in order to provide a perspective for investors in order to get new loans. And this is how he started to, to build this, um, this ships and so on and so forth. But there was also another crucial transformation going on. And, and this was um, the fact that Ineos transformed bit by bit from a pure petrochemical upstream company, uh, sorry, a downstream uh, producer of oil and gas and petrochemicals to an upstream producer of oil and gas, meaning that he wanted to have full control over the full life cycle of his supply chain. And, and so far he achieved that. By 2016, we see the first US frack gas arriving at, at um, Grange Moss and also Roughness in Norway. He buys more and more um, oil and gas assets in, in the North Sea. And then in 2017, something very crucial happens again. He buys the Fortis pipeline system uh, from BP again, um, which you know, has, has put him in, in quite a dominant position with regard to um, the pressure that he's able to, to put on, on the Scottish, but also um, the, the English governments. In the same year, he announced also that he'll invest further in his assets at Antwerp, including in a butane storage tank, also aimed to store frack gas. And 
Last year, he announced that he wants to build the first ethane cracker, all based on frac gas uh, for the last 20 years in Antwerp. Um, and this year, uh, he managed to convince BP to sell their whole petrochemical business to Ineos for $5 billion. So one wonders how he was able to do this, um, given the fact that um, their profits plunged uh, by 95% in 2019. Um, and given the fact that um, they're still, according to, re to their own annual report 2019, they're still significantly indebted. Um, and by the end of 2019, they had total consolidated loans and borrowings of 6.9 billion euros. So we see that this company still carries a lot of debt um, there's a lot of insecurity, um, there's an over-reliance on, on frac gas from the U.S. But nonetheless, Jim Radcliffe, as, as, a, as, a, as a person, has managed to extract a lot of private wealth out of this very complex structure that he has created. Going back a bit and, 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 and you know, um, trying to get an, an overview of the supply chain, I'm using this map from the Plastic Atlas um, that was published last year, um, 2019, by the Heinrich Böll Foundation. So you see <clears throat> the main spots are Pennsylvania and also Houston. So Ineos takes advantage of, of this um, shale gas boom, as they call it, in, in Pennsylvania, where they had over 10,000 fracking rigs uh, since 2005. Um, with a huge impact on, on the communities and the environment in, in Pennsylvania. Um, and he relies on, on the Marina East pipeline project, an existing pipeline that needs to be ex expanded and a second pipeline that needs to be built in order to be able to get um, the full uh, supply of gas that he has contracted with his main partner in the US, and that's a company named Sunoco. Uh, a daughter company of energy transfer partners. And this is the company behind the North Dakota pipeline uh, that many of you might heard of. And what he's doing now since 2016 is he uh, ships the frac gas either from Houston or whenever there's a problem with this pipeline and, and um, you'll see some, some articles in a minute that there are a lot of problems with, with the construction of this pipeline he manages to get the raw materials that he needs from Houston uh, and that the ships are, are driving to um, Range Mouse, as I've already mentioned, or Norway. And here's again, uh, an indicator of their plans at Antwerp. And there are further plants that are connected to their petrochemical facilities at, at Cologne. So Aeneas wants to store the frac gas here in, at Antwerp and they've commissioned also uh, some more ships that shall then um, deliver, uh, further deliver frac gas to their petrochemical facilities at Cologne. But what does this really mean for the communities that, leave, uh, that live in these areas? Um, to give you some, you know, overview of what's going on is, uh, is the fact that as I've already mentioned, during the construction of the Marina East pipelines, there have been ongoing violations against environmental um, health and, and uh, worker safety regulations. Um, back in 2018, um, the partner of Inyo Sunoku was fined $12.6 million. That's the largest single fine the DEP has ever ordered. Um, but this didn't stop the, the company from doing a shitty job. So there's another fine from, from 2019, uh, over $300,000 fine for construction violations. Um, another 2 million fine uh, beginning of this year uh, for spills into a lake. Um, another 200 uh, um, US dollar fine uh, back in February, 2020. Even the FBI is now investigating the, uh, the Governor Wolf's administration in the issuing of the Marina East pipeline permits. Um, and because of the fact that Ineos was blocked, and that's due to, to, to your fight mainly in, in Scotland, but also to the fight of, of 
the anti-fracking movement in England, because they were blocked in the UK to, to, to frack for the raw materials that they need, um, they now have plans to actually begin fracking in Texas. Uh, again, in order to, to secure the supply chain of raw materials that they desperately need to produce more virgin plastics than no one else needs. When we switched to, to Europe, we also realized that at all their petrochemical facilities, there are um, constant ongoing accidents, spills, explosion, leaks. Uh, they've been um, rated worst polluter in, in Scotland several times. Um, um, this happened recently in actual fact, I think a week ago, they were ranked again worst polluter in Scotland. Um, I think you're familiar with this one, uh, and I've already touched upon it. One big issue uh, within this whole plastic pollution cycle is that people are not really aware of the fact that this industry loses the first product in its millions and billions. When people talk about plastic waste, they often think of a, of a consumer good product that, that ends up in the environment because simply because we consumers are not, you know, you know, really, we don't care about the environment. So we buy this stuff, we, we throw it away, and it ends up in the environment. But in actual fact, the plastic waste problem starts with the producer. And you see it in Scotland, but you don't not only see it in Scotland, and this is the reason why, why I call this a structural problem, you also see it at Antwerp, where Enios also has a petrochemical facilities. And this picture, for example, I took this picture last year in, in July. This is in, in a, a Natura 2000 protected site. This happens on a regular basis and, and there's no solution for that. But nonetheless, Enios wants to build new ethane cracker that will produce more plastic pellets that will end up in the environment. That's another picture. And the same company um, has really the nerves to put this slogan on their new boats um, that shall carry the raw materials from Antwerp to Cologne. It says, keep our rivers clean. I mean, this is pure hypocrisy. Uh, uh, there's, I don't know. I mean, you have to have some humor uh, to do this, you know, uh, taking a, into account what you're responsible for. And at the same time, he, he has no problems whatsoever, um, despite the fact that he was able to, to extract this enormous private wealth. He has no problems whatsoever to reach out again to, um, to the Scottish and also the British government um, during the pandemic, um, asking for a 500 million pound loan. Um, together with, with Post Scotland and also Greenpeace UK, we've asked the Scottish and also the British government if they're in actual fact keen to give this man this loan. Um, so far we have received some, some non-answers, I would call them from, from the Scottish government, uh, but, but more with a, well, we're not really inclined to give them the loan tone. Um, the, the English government has com completely ignored our, our, um, our um, ask. But, um, after he called for, for a loan, he, he had no problem whatsoever to, uh, to move to Monaco, um, simply because he wants to, to, um, to save um, taxes for his uh, And, and this, this, this whole story that is almost hard to believe, it beggars belief, you know, each time that a, that a new um, headline pops up with something that happens, either an explosion, an accident, a cologne, something that happens, an adverb, it, and, and then you, you read something like Sir Jim Ratcliffe moves now to Monaco and he seeks a loan and he, he tries to downplay the risks of fracking. Um, all this is something that doesn't go unnoticed by the people. And that's the reason why, you know, along the supply chain of Ineos, people stood up and are standing up, no matter if it's in UK, no matter if it's in, in, in Belgium. Um, this picture was, was taken last year during the Tour of France um, in Brussels, no matter if it's in Yorkshire, um, no matter if it's in, in Pennsylvania, um, 
all over the supply chain of Ineos, people are standing up and are fighting um, this company, are fighting the fracking for plastics business model because um, they're more and more aware of, of the, the role that the petrochemical industry plays and also the, the key and pivotal role of Enios and of um, Jim Radcliffe. And I'll end uh, my presentation with these pictures. Um, this is from an action that took place um, last weekend um, in the port of Antwerp. And it's in an area owned by Enios. Um, you see that there are trees and, and, and bushes um, so this is this is a forest that Ineos wants to cut down, uh, five, uh, 55 hectares of, of forest that Ineos wants to cut down so that they can build the new um, uh, plastic facilities that I've mentioned. And I'll finish with, with one note. I think that um, only united, only if we stand united, companies like Ineos will fall and at the end of the day we will definitely be be capable of um you know destructing this this um this relationship of the fracked states of america with the european um petrochemical and and plastics industry and um i, I saw it so many times that you know sometimes only a handful of people if they're really willing to start fighting these giants more and more people will join. And um, last year, to, and I'll end on that, last year, um, there were literally maybe five, six people who knew about Ineos, who knew about the, the fracking for plastics link. During this last action in, in, in the port of Antwerp, they had 150 climate activists that were willing to, to, to lock themselves uh, up um, that knew that they will face arrest um, uh, and nonetheless they did it um, and I know that the movement grew and I think that at the end of the day um, we all together uh, and, and everything we do United will bring down companies like Ineos and, and will also help to start this just transition process that you guys will talk about which is crucial because um, it will be the workers and their families who will suffer when, let's say, within the next five to 10 years, we will suddenly realize that we cannot allow these, these assets to run um, any longer. And, and we also cannot allow to, um, to basically let our economies be, um, be locked in into the dependency from fossil fuels. Thank you.